Hey guys, I'm bringing back the video blogs. I have not done these in quite some time, so I expect this one to be a little rusty. As you can already see, the sun and the lighting are a little bit off. I'm still sort of getting into the routine, building up new lighting systems and all that kind of stuff, because it has. It's been probably over six months. In fact, I don't even know if I've done a like an in-person video blog this year in 2016. So, But it is the type of video that I do want to bring back. Um, and it's not just me. A number of you have actually asked that I bring back the sort of the rambly vloggy type videos that despite being some of my most viewed videos still get a rather large number of people in the comments section uh, complaining about the length of them or not getting to the point too quickly whereas the, I suppose in some ways them being rambly is is almost part of of their makeup and their sort of overall atmosphere and narrative I guess. So anyway today I'm going to talk a little bit about my daily driver Manjaro um, and why I've ditched Linux Mint to uh, to use it. Uh, I guess the title of this video would naturally be why I'm ditching Linux Mint uh, for Manjaro in the sort of the similar sort of chain of videos I've got why I'm ditching A for operating system B. So I'm on Manjaro now um, and that's not to say that I dislike Linux Mint and that's again not to say that I dislike Ubuntu. I think that they've all of these distributions have brought a really positive uh, you know wave of, of um, a progression into the open source operating system world, especially for the desktop, which is obviously where this channel focuses on. So basically with Mint, it fits a very specific user base and it's still a um, an operating system I would recommend to almost anyone who wants to get into Linux and wants, a f but they want to do it on their own. They're not going to have any anyone holding their hand or anything like that. Linux Mint is a very good operating system where you can just give it to someone and allow them to work it out. The application installer, while not overly um, flashy, while not too much like an app store, still provides the functionality of accessing the software repositories. So it, it's, um, whereas Linux, the Linux desktop did have app stores long before Windows 10 or, or Apple, the, uh, the concept of them in Linux, of course, is substantially different, whether they're made up primarily of open source um, software or with at least freely available software. And and it's and, it, and you're not really expected to pay for it. Ubuntu did bring in a kind of software store where there were some Ubuntu specific applications that you could pay one or two pounds for. But I don't think I know anyone who actually ever invested any serious money in this store. And part of that actually is is Ubuntu often having this reputation of not following through with products and making sort of very uh, rash uh, UI decisions, uh, which can often turn things on their head. Most notably, of course, Ubuntu won the cloud storage platform uh, being shelved. Um, it has probably given a lot of people pause to think, well, maybe if Ubuntu are trying to actually make some money, not necessarily on the operating system, but some of the things that go along with it, and they fail to commit to these kind of projects, putting any money in Ubuntu and Canonical as a company definitely makes me personally hesitate, especially in regards to a service, because I have a feeling that that service might not be there in a couple of years' time. I also have a very similar hesitation when it comes to Google, because Google also occasionally, uh, I'm going to say occasionally, some people will probably say more than occasionally, pull the rug out from under you with their free services. And this is why I prefer to pay for, for certain things. I prefer to pay for email, because as an email, like I am the consumer, and they have legal obligations. When you actually make a financial transaction, I think there's like a legal term for it. I don't know it specifically. Um, and I think the money is something called uh, consideration. And basically, when you pay for something, you're entitled to consumer rights, whereas if you're receiving something for free, uh, even if the thing that you're receiving for free makes all the promises in the world, there's no legal recourse you can do. So, for example, if I decided to fit out an, um, an, an office with the, you know, with a Linux distribution, and that Linux distribution turned out after a couple of releases to really completely do a U-turn and go horrendously downhill, starts removing features and all that kind of stuff, I can't go then ahead and sue them by saying, well, you promised me a good operating system for free, and you failed to deliver, because there is no, like, money exchanging hands. It's not a deal. It's a, a gift, as it were. So um, that's why I like paying for email is because um, a free email from from Google, although it's not free, it's fiscally free or, or gratis, um, they can still basically root through your emails, uh, take any liberties they want. Whereas with my paid for email service, um, basically, they have to lay out, well, we won't disclose any of your information, um, and, th you know, all of this is legally binding. Obviously, there are, like, legal ramifications, for example, if um, a law enforcement uh, within the country of operation 
approaches them with a warrant, they obviously have to step aside. Um, and they also have a privacy policy um, that specifically deals with international treaties as well. So they've taken it very, very seriously. So this is again why, like, I don't pay very much. I pay, I pay like, I'm, I'm on like one of the lower brackets of how much I pay. But the fact that you pay means that they have more obligation to you than, uh, than free services. So again, this is, this is a rambly off point video. Um, but in short, um, Linux Mint fits a very specific user base. Uh, and it's a certain, certainly it's a user base that I would, um, you know, that, that has its place in the community. And, and Ubuntu Mint is a great starting um, distribution. But not only that, like it is good for, for beyond newbies. It is good for beyond uh, new users uh, because it's stable. It's a very stable operating system uh, in the sense that it, you know, it works off a long-term support base of Ubuntu. And I obviously, I know that 1604 is far from, from stable and I got a lot of flack for calling it rock solid in the Neon review and rightfully so. That was a that was a theoretical rock, <laughs> rock solid rather than a than a um, than a pragmatic one, but Mint seemed to have, t have taken the Ubuntu distribution, and then they, they do seem to have actually um, rounded off a lot of the problems that 1604 had. I can't remember or don't know specifically if the um, the problem with the wireless drivers, which I think primarily affected Broadcom, um, necessary you know whether or not that problem surfaced. I was told that just um, a different version of network manager would have solved this problem. So apparently it's not an easy problem. It's not a difficult problem to solve anyway. I don't know. It looks like a horrible mess that Ubuntu seem to have got themselves in and for some reason are refusing to get themselves out of. Um, Mint, in my experiences, seemed to have filled all of the, the holes that Ubuntu had. Um, so Mint might be a, a, a more solid step, at least in for the next two years, than Ubuntu in that regard. Also, um, it used to come with um, Codex, and that for a new user makes the world of difference, especially if they're like good codecs as well. Like Linux Mint used different codecs uh, for its multimedia stuff than Ubuntu and Linux Mint's codecs were substantially better, especially for things like the MTS format, the Panasonic and uh, Canon cameras recording as well. So it like Linux Mint has a lot going for it. So why did I choose Manjaro? Well, Manjaro is based on Arch. It's a rolling distribution. So whereas with Linux Mint and Ubuntu, every six months, they'll bring out a, a release or a, or a, um, a, a sort of incremental release, which, um, which updates all the software all at once. Now, there are security updates uh, and, and sort of incremental updates in between those six month big schedule releases, um, or sometimes if you're using long term support releases, or you're only updating major versions of Linux Mint, that's really every two to five years, I guess, really. So basically, um, with Manjaro, it's considered a rolling release. Now, it's really a semi rolling release more than anything else, it seems to update um, all its software repositories and everything about once a month, but it's about a once a month when it's ready. So it's not like there isn't like a, it doesn't seem to be a day every single month, uh, where you can always set your watch for an upgrade, it upgrades when the upgrades are ready, which is again something I don't mind, it's it's fine, um, and and not having a schedule in that department for a home user and for a home operating system is completely fine, in, at least in my personal opinion. I mean, Windows 10 do it, and I, I I know saying being better than Windows 10 it doesn't really mean much to you guys, but um, when it comes to sort of the professional space and when it comes to to new users who are going to be comparing Linux-based operating sy systems to Windows ones, I, that comparison. I mean, there's something there, even if it might not necessarily be relevant to most of you guys. So, um, so uh, Manjaro definitely upgrades more regularly, and it does so. It seems to do so in a like a pseudo incremental fashion. Uh, in, in the like, it does it in sort of stages, but only because those stages seem to make the process go significantly smoother. Uh, upgrading to Manjaro, you upgrade all your packages, so you get a, uh, your your software stack is is pretty up to date, and that. In, 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 in a way, solves a lot of problems at, at a very early convenience. And what I mean by this is, say there's a regression, a problem has arisen in one of the packages that I use. Now, if that problem has arisen in an Ubuntu-based distribution, I have to wait either six months to the next small release or two, up to two years uh, for the next big release before that problem can necessarily be fixed. I might get lucky and there might be um, a, an update patch between the you know between distributions which actually might solve the problem in my experience that doesn't generally happen and even with the network manager problem that we're seeing in ubuntu that also um is like it hasn't been fixed on the point one release so i i mean i love ubuntu but this is a big this is a big problem this they've dropped the ball in a very big way here so 
Uh, I, I, you know, I wish I, I wish I could, I wish I could find a silver lining to this, but this actually turns a lot of newbies off Linux. Anyway, Mint seems to have covered a lot of the bases. I don't know whether or not the network manager problem still comes across because I've not tested a machine that's susceptible to that issue on Linux Mint right now. But Manjaro would not have that network manager problem because it would, it would the second a newer version of network manager would be available, you'd get it. And you can always have this option to roll back. So for example, if you upgrade a piece of software and it turns out that a bug had, had, had arisen out of it, there is um, a command, there is a program called downgrade where you can actually downgrade back to the previous version. This can cause problems when um, you, when it comes to version matching and sometimes like more complicated programs that rely on rather large um, libraries of dependencies. There can be issues there with particularly complex programs. With simple programs, rolling back is no problem at all. And this is all part of the the like the Unix philosophy of uh, if everything has a small, you know, if everything is a single purpose uh, program that all work, in, you know, in accordance to standards and uh, standards and, and sort of all, all in harmony, then rolling back any one of these individual components for the most part should be completely fine. Linux is not the Unix way of thinking, although it sometimes adopts it when it when it sees it as a, a viable solution to any given problem. Problem. Um, it, it, yeah, so so downgrading is a bit hit and miss depending on the, the piece of software in question. Um, but um, I have had to roll back Caden Live when a, a pretty nasty bug uh, arose out of that, and and that worked. So you know, it seems to it seems to be doing all right uh, in regards to stability. When I upgrade Manjaro, I have never had a, uh, like a, a show stopping breakage. Um, I like that Manjaro also allows you to micromanage your kernels, which is really, really quite interesting. Um, and distributions usually aren't as upfront about kernel management as, as Manjaro is, but there's a little GUI interface. You can just pull up a window and go, here, here are the, the kernels that are available to you. These are long-term support. These are the ones that are already installed. This is the one that we recommend, but feel free to go against our recommendation. Um, and it's, I think, as, as of recording this, the latest kernel, I think, is 4.7, but it may, there may, <laughs> yeah, I think it's this 4.7. Seven is like like the like the latest kernel about now these days, um, but I could be wrong. Um, so, yeah, Manjaro because it's up to date, it seems to it, it seems to um, sort of navigate past a lot of the problems that scheduled based releases have. So a lot of you guys are probably about to ask the question: Well, I'm using Manjaro, why not use Arch? I mean, I'm clearly able to use Arch. Arch is nowhere near as difficult as people make out to be. I think people like to sort of brag about, oh, I've got an Arch computer, run the latest open source software, all that kind of stuff. And it sounds difficult because you get so much choice and customizability of the operating system. But if you install something like Antergos, which is really just an Arch installer for Arch, uh, you um, it, it's a piece of cake. You can have Arch up and running on just about any machine um, very, very easily. So uh, so the reason I chose Manjaro is because, I, well, first off, I, I tried Manjaro before I tried Antergos. In, you know, if you look at, at my history of videos when I did those full, long, daily driver-based reviews, uh, uh, Manjaro was before Antergos, and I was impressed with both of them. But because I guess I was more f familiar with Manjaro because I, I was aware of it longer and had been using it longer, I sort of tended to opt for that. If Manjaro disappeared tomorrow, I'd be more than happy to move across to either Pure Arch or, uh, or Antergos. Both of those look really quite good. I love what Antergos are doing with their installer as well. The, the ability to choose your desktop environment from the installation process. I think that is a brilliant idea. I remember seeing it in old versions of uh, SUSE, and I think you can even do that in OpenSUSE as well, and a few other distributions. Uh, certainly, so, uh, but but not Ubuntu, not Mint, not Fedora. I don't think. I think you, you, with those distributions, you're supposed to actually download a specific ISO. But the trouble is, uh, it's, Mint exemplifies this problem really, really well, where they have two flagship distributions: a Mate version and a Cinnamon version. They make approximate. Uh, descriptions as to the differences between the two. So, for example, Mate they describe as stable, uh, customizable, traditional. I think might be those kind of words. Whereas with uh, Cinnamon, they des they describe it as uh, modern, cutting edge. Um, you know, like exciting, new. So they kind of paint the two distributions in different lights, but the distributions themselves are set up and laid out so similarly that they really ought to just pick one and go with a flagship distribution. And hell, maybe they should just go with the Mate one. I mean, it themes better. It's on. It's, it's, it's more widely supported. It's more widely developed. I mean, Mate really lo does look promising. Cinnamon, sure, it looks promising too, but, but 
what's it bringing to the table that Marte isn't? That's, uh, you know, there are a few things in the way that it does things, in the way that it themes. And uh, Cinnamon, in some ways, seems a little bit more user friendly, but really, no, nothing that can't be fixed through through Mate. I think that this is um, this is a typical Linux situation of um, over forking. But who am I to say? You know, this is all the natural selection of ideas. I'm, you know, I, I have no right to tell any distribution how to manage their way because, um, you know, if they listen to me, they probably wouldn't end up with a great distribution. So, um, you know, there's that. So yeah, Manjaro, really like it so far. I've probably been using it for the best part of a year, probably over a year now. So this video was planned really back then when I decided to use Manjaro as a daily driver. But it, I was into using Manjaro as a daily driver for a few months before I even realized that I wanted to stick with it. It was a very much a case of, I'll stick with Manjaro until something better comes along. Nothing better came along. So I decided to go with it. It has up-to-date software. Uh, it actually tests its software a little bit more than, than Arch. I think it holds uh, all its software upgrades back for a, for a couple of weeks, um, hence why it seems to have that incremental stage of, of um, upgrade. Um, and it holds back, uh, and uh, I say it upgrades about once a month, maybe about once a month when it's slow, sometimes it's a bit more regularly. And uh, uh, But it holds back packages and then it tests them a little bit more. It allows them to sort of run around in the in the Manjaro beta testing sort of ecosystem. And um, and then they sort of push to upgrade um, in stages, which, I mean, it seems stable. I mean, I've not had an upgrade process that's gone horribly wrong. The worst that I've ever had with an upgrade process, and you do have to deal with uh, upgrade issues. I've just never had anything that's, that's stopped me from booting up or logging in. Um, upgrade process, um, upgrade um, problems can include things like um, the big one was when GNOME updated to 3.20, they completely changed how they did the GTK themes, and that meant that I had to find a theme that had been updated almost in tandem with GNOME, which meant that a lot of GTK themes suddenly became unusable. Now, that was not a problem of Manjaro, that was a problem of GNOME, but because GNOME um, basically uh, focus around... Um, I think they focus more around Fedora, but they also, you know, because they seem to work mostly with scheduled um, distributions, uh, that the repositories can kind of match the version of GNOME in question, whereas rolling distributions basically have to have the awareness to be able to adapt and, and look at the forums and look at the re release notes as well. Uh, when you upgrade a rolling distribution, especially something like Manjaro, um, it's always worth reading some of the, the known issues because uh, things like um, different libraries and dependency issues occasionally crop up, but they do crop up in ways that are generally fixable. Like an upgrade isn't pushed forward if there isn't a way to, to work it out, generally speaking. Now, Manjaro is still reasonably new it's, uh, as, a, as a mainstream distribution. I think it's been around for a few years now as a very alternative sort of um, distribution for enthusiasts. But in you know recently, over the past couple of years, it really has been becoming more and more of a mainstream focused distribution in the Linux ecosystem that's not Ubuntu. And um, and it seems to be, you know, I like it. A lot of people out there like it. Spatry really likes it. He's done a load of good videos on it. Um, but it is. It's, it's for, for the intermediate Linux user who wants up-to-date software, doesn't mind tweaking a few things, isn't too scared of the command line when it comes to things like editing config files, deleting cache files, that kind of stuff. If you have an awareness of your system, and even if you want to even micromanage it, Manjaro is pretty good from that regard. It comes with a minimal installer, which means that it installs the basic command line with basic tools, and then you can install your desktop environments on top of that, and you can completely manage every, almost every aspect of your system. A lot of people don't like Manjaro because it traditionally comes with a lot of bloat. I can certainly understand that, but in that case, this distribution just isn't for you. Just go with standard Arch. Uh, there are a few extra programs in the Manjaro repositories, but not so many that uh, it really sort of runs over Arch and that, you know, Arch and, and Manjaro, for all intents and purposes, have the same major applications in their repositories. So, um, and also, you know, when it comes to things like, uh, you know, I'm doing a lot more from the command line the more I use Linux these days as well. Not out of any kind of desire to learn the command line, but simply because it just seems easier than a lot of GUI-based, um, you know, interfaces. So, my transition from Mint to Manjaro is certainly uh, one that's gone from a positive distribution to an even more positive distribution. This just reinforces my personal opinion that there, for the most part, isn't a wrong distribution to use. 
Um, it's just a matter of finding the distribution that works with your use case. There are distributions, for example, I would not use Fedora for gaming, for example. Now, I know that that's changing, and I know that um, some of you actually said in Fedora 24, they've actually made it more easier to install things like NVIDIA drivers and Steam and stuff like that. And if Fedora go down this road of making it a more home-focused distribution, then I'm certainly going to be following it, and it's certainly going to be a contender for going up against Manjaro, because... Uh, you know, an, a, 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 a distribution that can upgrade really stably every six months doesn't leave you that far behind in terms of software. But, uh, but Fedora doesn't have a particularly large software repository as well. So uh, certainly not compared to Manjaro, Ubuntu. Small correction, actually. OpenSUSE does have one of the largest software repositories out there, something which I completely misinterpreted and, and, and didn't realize at the time of reviewing that distribution because a lot of the software packages that I personally used weren't available. It felt like there were fewer. My personal benchmarks weren't met. Therefore, I sort of made the assumption that everyone's personal benchmarks weren't met, which, of course, was far from the case. So you can see what I mean by these blogs get incredibly rambly. Uh, I think I'm going to wrap up now, but needless to say, if you're looking for a distribution that is pretty up to date, uh, that isn't too, that, that is for the most part stable, really, Re you know, I would call it a stable distribution. Um, the, the community is great as well. Actually, that's something I completely forgot to mention. And it's something that's a really big part of me choosing a Linux distribution as well. For example, uh, I liked the Linux Mint. When a commu communities can get too big to the point where they become very clinical and functional and pragmatic, and that can often, it often feels like the, 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 the distribution at that point has lost its heart when it comes to the support system becoming so formalized. Obviously, that isn't necessarily the case. They're just trying to find a way to manage a large number of users in the most efficient way possible. But when you've got smaller communities like the Linux Mint community, like the Manjaro community, uh, the people they uh, will, will often, um, the, you know, it's, it's not so formal. You can actually sort of get away with asking uh, quest like sort of what you call stupid questions without um, having a wave of derision flown over you or anything like that. It's, you know, like people are very accepting of mistakes. People are very uh, help, you know, they're very sort of, you know they'll help you out and and they'll um and they'll make sure that your experience with things like Manjaro and Mint are good. That's at least my personal experience with the smaller communities as well is that they tend to have a more personal um, attachment to the distribution which they're representing, and as a result, that enthusiasm kind of washes off on you, or at least I personally find that as well. So you know they they the communities tend to be a little bit more laid back and and a little bit more manageable, and I think that that tends to result in in a more genuine kind of support and a more genuine community. That's not to say that like bigger communities like Ubuntu and the Red Hat communities aren't um, good communities. They, I just find that they sort of hit a level of professionalism, which I suppose your amateur computer user might not necessarily identify with. That's just a few thoughts. Feel free to, to uh, disagree down in the comments section below. Uh, really, this video was here just as a bit of a catch up to um, to reintroduce the um, the fancy. Um, you know, the, the video is back, so um, so I know that some of you will be excited. Um, again, I apologise for like the, the the funny lighting as well. Obviously, I've got the white light from the daytime out there. My indoor lighting setup is um, orange light um, because. It is, and um, so obviously, if I like, if I mixed, um, if I put on my, see, you can see it doesn't really sort of the the, the the coloration doesn't doesn't, and that's just one light. Like if I put on the full light setup, I'll be like orange on this side and purple on this side, and it's quite, um, it, it it looks like a Christopher Nolan movie gone wrong. <laughs> so it's, it's almost like if I tried to direct a Christopher Christopher Nolan movie. So anyway, I'm going to hope, and hope to do maybe about one of these a week. I'm going to try and bring in the camera a little bit more, um, simply just because I feel like I've been a little bit lazy now. We're just doing so many of the audio-only videos. So guys, thank you very much for watching. Feel free to discuss down in the comments section below. And um, until next time, I've been Chris Ware, and you've been awesome. Take care now.